Okay, before we can start getting into details of uh, setup and what the various uh, changes do, uh, we need to get a basic background in the physics of setup and some terminology. So, first thing, tires. Tires are the most important thing in your setup. If you haven't got the right tires, uh, you know, you can make all the setup changes you want, uh, but you're never going to be as fast as the fast guys. So the first thing is to make sure you've got the right tires for the surface that you're running on. Uh, that's usually pretty easy to do. You can usually just talk to the fast guys and they'll be more than willing to help you out. Um, the other thing with tires is how the uh, vertical load translates to lateral grip. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit in uh, the next slide. Uh, next thing is balance. This is the distribution of the weight transfer between the inside and outside tires and between the front and the rear. Um, and we can adjust and manipulate this to change the handling characteristics by <clears throat> changing our uh, roll stiffness values, uh, the roll center positions of the uh, suspension, and the, uh, the CG position and height, which is a little more difficult to do because that involves changing uh, uh, and lowering uh, components on the chassis. Uh, the other thing that uh, affects the uh, affects your setup is the what I call a response or the overall stiffness. Uh, so this is how stiff the car is. Um, this is uh, affected by uh, the sprung mass CG height, the roll stiffness, roll center positions, and there's an indicator that we'll see in a minute, which is called the roll chassis roll sensitivity. Uh, generally, you want a soft setup for off-road conditions because you've got to handle all kinds of bumps and landing up jumps and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and you want a stiffer uh, chassis setup for um, on-road applications. Um, even you know the stiffest setups you want are probably for uh, cars that are running with foam tires. Uh, foam tires are very stiff and and don't have a lot of uh, compliance in the tire, so you need to make minimize the amount of chassis roll that you have so that the uh, tire contact patch stays relatively constant. Uh, next is tire contact patch. Okay, so this is affected by the tread, the tire tread, the compound that you're running, uh, the sidewall stiffness, the insert you have in the tire and the air gap between the insert and the actual tire itself. Um, various different kinds of tires, they vary all over the map. Uh, you know, we've got uh, the very stiff foam tires for on road uh, 8 scale and 10 scale cars. We've got uh, rubber tire on road cars that have more compliance in the sidewall. Um, and more deformation of the tire carcass itself. And then we've got the other extreme, which is off-road, you know, where the tires are kind of call them balloons, somewhere between a balloon and a pizza cutter, depending on how much uh, RPM you've got in the tire. Um, so obviously the tire contact patch is something that's very important. Um, what you'd use to, to, maximize that is uh, your static camber settings and the camber gain. That's how the camber changes as the suspension moves. Uh, also the chassis roll sensitivity. The more the chassis rolls, the more camber gain and more camber change you get. Uh, and your ultimate goal here is to maximize the tire contact patch. Next is steering geometry. Um, you need to try and optimize your steering ackerman to suit the track layout. Uh, if you've got a tight twisty track, you're going to want more steering ackerman. Uh, an open sweeping flowing track is probably going to work better with less ackerman. And last but by no means least is damping. Um, this is how you set up your shocks uh, to control the springs and anti-roll bars. They say here that 
springs and anti-roll bars are the muscle that resist the roll of the car and the dampers or shocks are what control that muscle or the brains of the system so that the, the uh, car doesn't start oscillating out of control. So you need to adjust your damping to match the uh, temperature where you're racing, whether it's hot or cold. Uh, the spring rates that you're using, heavier spring rates require more damping. Uh, the shock angles that you're running and the track conditions, whether it's a smooth surface or bumping surface or whatever. Okay, first thing I want to talk about is some characteristics of tires. Um, very unlikely we will ever have tire data because you need to have tire data for every surface you run on, different camber angles, and every tire compound and insert, and on and on and on. So it's uh, an absolutely staggering amount of, of uh, data that would require to uh, to generate these curves. But what I've got shown here is an old uh, Formula One tire. And there's some important things that we can learn by just looking at this this uh, performance curve for the tire. So first off, on the x-axis here, we have the uh, slip angle. And the easiest way to think of the slip angle is it's the difference between the axis of the tire and the direction the car is going. So if you think about the rear of our cars, we normally run 2 to 3 degrees of rear toe on the, on the each side of the car. So if the car is going down the straightaway, you would have two or three degrees of slip angle in the car from the beginning. So you'd be somewhere in this range here and that would be the forces that you would develop, develop depending on how much vertical load is on the car. So the vertical axis here gives you the lateral force or the lateral grip that the tire can develop. And each one of these curves is a constant vertical force on the tire. So the upper one is with a thousand pounds, uh, the bottom one, 400 pounds. Uh, the other thing we can see from here is that as you increase the amount of vertical load, these lines are getting closer and closer together. So the net increase in lateral force that you get as a, and by increasing the vertical load becomes less and less the further or the higher the, the vertical load applied is. The other thing is is that there is a an optimum slip angle where you develop the maximum lateral force. So that's what this red line is here. It just connects sort of the peaks of each one of these lines together. So one of the things I want to illustrate is, is how the amount of lateral load transfer affects the total lateral force that the tires can develop. So we're going to look at two cases here. One case is going to be with a, a significant amount of uh, lateral load transfer. So if we're looking at from the inside tire to the outside tire, um, of a thousand pounds to 400 pounds and the other one we're going to look at is a small lateral load transfer which would be 600 pounds on the inside tires and 800 pounds on the outside tires. So let's look at the uh, the low weight transfer or a lateral load transfer case first so that's going to be these two points here. So if we say this is uh, uh, on this point is going to be 1,025 pounds. Uh, this point here is going to be 1,225 pounds. So the total lateral force that we're going to develop between these two points is roughly 2,250 pounds. Okay, and that's for a 200 pound difference between the load on the inside and outside tires. So now if we look at the other case, where we're going from 400 pounds on the inside tires to 1,000 pounds on the inside tires, uh, we're going to end up with the upper line here. We're going to call that uh, 1,400 pounds, and we'll call this one 700 pounds. So the total of that is 2,100 pounds. So that is actually less lateral force developed for the high weight transfer case 
than the low weight transfer tapes. So what this means is, is you want to try and minimize the weight transfer to maximize the grip. That's the important thing to realize. Okay, so now we know that we want to minimize the weight transfer from the inside to the outside. Uh, let's have a look at, at how we can do that. So this little graphic here just shows you uh, a very simple relationship for the what's called the total lateral load transfer. So this is the total load that's transferred from the inside tires to the outside tires in cornering. So the equation to calculate that is really quite simple. It's the vertical load, the vertical weight of the car, times the lateral acceleration force that your car is undergoing, times the height of the center of gravity above ground level, divided by the track width. So we can determine quite a few important points here. Um, to minimize the weight transfer, so we want this number to be as small as we can get it, you want to minimize the weight, you want to minimize the height of the center of gravity above ground, and you want to maximize the track width. So those are the three things that are very important in trying to maximize grip. That's why all race cars have the lowest center of gravity possible and are as lightweight as possible and the track width is as wide as, as the rules will allow. Uh, if that wasn't the case we'd all be driving around in monster trucks, uh, which we're not. So, Okay, so now we know that we want to try and minimize the lateral load transfer. <coughs> How can we use that to our advantage? So what we need to do is to separate the um, weight transfer so that we can determine how it's distributed between the front and rear of the car. So to do that we need to know what the sprung and unsprung masses are and the center of gravity positions of those sprung and unsprung masses. We also need to know what the front and rear roll centers are and the suspension roll stiffness. So you can see here in this little graphic we've got the sprung mass now so we've separated the sprung mass out and then we have a front unsprung mass and a rear unsprung mass and these values are essentially the weight of the tires and the portion of the uh, uh, suspension arms that are outboard of the shocks and axles and well, portion of the axles and wheel bearings and that sort of thing. So that's your unsprung mass. Your sprung mass is everything that's inboard of the shocks and is generally everything that's attached to the chassis. So by knowing our front and rear unsprung masses, this is fairly easy to determine with a set of four wheel scales, and knowing the location of our front and rear roll center, we can also draw what's called the neutral roll axis. So this is just a line that connects the front and the rear roll centers, and it is the theoretical line about which the chassis rolls. So the important thing to get here is the height of the sprung mass center of gravity above the neutral roll axis. And we'll see why here in a second. Okay. Okay, so now we've got everything separated out. Uh, we can use that information to determine the weight on each of the wheels. Uh, so the first thing is the uh, uh, sprung g-force, which is the lateral force that's developed by uh, cornering forces. That is simply the sprung mass times your lateral g-force. Now the distance from the neutral roll axis to the center of gravity of the sprung mass times your sprung g-force gives you what's called the roll moment. So the roll moment is what actually makes the chassis roll in the corners. What's resisting that roll moment is our shocks, springs, and anti-roll bars out here. So the stiffer these components are, the less the chassis rolls. The lower this uh, point in the neutral roll axis is, 
the more the chassis rolls because it has a, a greater rolling moment. So it's really a balancing act between the rolling moment and the springs, shocks, and anti-roll bars that are trying to resist that force. And that's how you adjust the weight that is transferred to each of the wheels. Okay, so that's it for this episode. Up next, we're going to start looking at suspension properties, and we'll be looking at some uh, demos using RC Crew Chief to try and give you some better insight into that. So we'll be looking at suspension properties and what they actually mean, and uh, which adjustments do you use to change them. So till next time.